What the Actual Fork podcast is co-hosted by two intuitive eating registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, owner of Fine Food Freedom, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. We can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we are medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest, darkest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So get comfy and join us for a casual convo where you can expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Welcome back to another episode of What the Actual Fork podcast. You have absolutely 100% (laughs) heard from or heard of the guests we had on today. We had Dr. Asher Larmy, who you may recognize more on social media at Fat Doctor UK, but Dr. Asher Larmy is a weight inclusive trans non-binary GP, formerly known as Natasha and the founder of the No Way, hashtag No Way and Way is W-E-I-G-H campaign. I don't really think that anything I could say right now will do the episode justice. So I feel like I just want to say, just go listen to it because it was amazing. It was insightful. It was beautiful. It was emotional and you just have to listen. (laughs) Yes. So doctor, I I say Dr. Asher, but I know that they're like, you don't need to call me doctor. Like on our (laughs) first time we recorded, they're like, I'm not this authoritative figure figure. You can just talk to me. So Asher kind of talks about their experience of going from Natasha to Asher, which was really special to hear that transition, as well as just everything behind the No Way campaign. And I do just want to give a little trigger warning. We do talk a little bit about some triggering words um, that came out of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And the first, what would you say, Jenna, 15 minutes, there's a little like pick up with some of the audio, but yeah. you can definitely still hear what Asher's saying. And then by like 20 minutes in, it just rolls completely and it's, it's good. So just, if you're like, why is this sound a little off? Like, is it me? No, unfortunately it was just because, you know, there it was protective. The and- <laughs> it was protective against the topic from the Academy of Nutrition yeah. and Dietetics. Yeah. So just a few little hiccups in <laughs> audio, but you can still hear everything they're saying. And, um, and then it, it definitely suits, it kind of figures itself out by the time we get 20 minutes in. So Anything else you want to add or should we just jump right in? Just enjoy it. I can't wait to hear what you guys think. Yeah. Asher's awesome. So enjoy this. Make sure to comment, shoot us a DM. Let us know what you think. Welcome back to another episode of what the actual fork podcast. We are excited for this episode because we have another repeat offender on here. We have a Dr. Asher Larmy. So Asher, thank you to you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. You know, I love you and I love your podcast and I also love the name. And every time you say it, I giggle. <laughs> I'm so immature. I just giggle every single time. <laughs> we, we love a good pun. So yeah. And the last episode we did together was probably one of the most inspiring episodes that I've ever been on. (laughs) Um, I know Sam agrees and we're so excited to, to just have this conversation. I think Sam and I have a million things we want to talk about. So rapid fire. (laughs) We're just going to get into it. But before we get into anything that we discussed off air that we want to talk about, we love to open episodes with and, and I, I have a idea where you might take this one, but we'll see. Um, what has been a big moment recently within diet culture world or just the world, because that's pretty much diet culture that has stopped you in your tracks and made you say what the actual fork is going on? So I know exactly what that is. And I'm going to get the name of the organization wrong again, but it's the recent guidance. It's not um, published yet. And I don't know when this podcast will be out, but whether or not it's published or not. Uh, the guidance from the Association of Nutrition and Dietetics. Is that you got it? The AMD. AMD. Yeah. AMD. Right. So the the guidance that they recently published, the sort of that's not official yet, that hasn't been, it's still in the 
sort of development phase. I, I read it and I was just like, guys, how do we keep taking one step forward and then like five step back? What what is happening here? How are we not getting the message? You know, anti diet anti-diet culture and it's not culture that's not the right word anti-diet science has existed for a long time now and it's not like this one study there are multiple studies you just you know intuitive eating alone has over 180 studies proving the, the veracity and the safety of, you know the health of every size movement has existed for a long time and the evidence is there and at the same time the evidence that's been coming out in the last 10 15 years talking about how actually our obsession with weight is actually driving um, so much of the sort of poor health outcomes that we're recognizing, especially the poor health outcomes that we associate with people with larger bodies. And the evidence that actually being in a larger body is not that bad for you. Sometimes actually it's kind of like a good thing, you know, like they call it the quote unquote obesity paradox, but weight loss just doesn't have any business in medicine anymore it, it shouldn't and it, and it shouldn't for a long time and I guess you know like the fact that this organization specifically an organization for nutritionists and dietitians hasn't taken on board any of this information and instead is essentially prescribing what I like to call eating disorders to people um you know let's think about the things that they're suggesting let's reduce your calorie intake let's um, get you monitoring your calories. Let's get you weighing yourself regularly. Let's get you exercising often. Let's try and reduce your body weight, like, you know, between five and 10%. All of this stuff, I read it and I think, look, that is actually the exact same stuff that I read whenever I'm like studying about the presentation of eating disorders. You're literally suggesting that people go out and do the very things you don't want them to do because they could end up with an eating disorder. And it's like alcohol, right? I mean, I've said this a few times recently, in our lifetimes when we've probably overdone it with the booze, it happens, it happens to a lot of us. Maybe some of us are drinking alcohol on a regular basis at, at, at levels that probably not particularly good for our health. There are some people that cannot stop drinking alcohol and become dependent on alcohol. And you don't know if that's going to be you because, you know, it's, it, you know, it runs in families, definitely genetics can to play, definitely childhood experiences, yada, yada, yada. There's lots of factors, but ultimately you might be the one that puts away loads of booze your whole entire life. Then again, gets sick, never becomes dependent, and it's absolutely fine. Or it could be the other way. You could be that one person that starts drinking when they're younger and ends up being addicted to alcohol for the rest of their life and struggling to kick that habit. The same applies for eating disorders. When you start in that process of disordered eating, you might be the one that sort of eats in a kind of disordered manner and it doesn't massively impact your health. And more importantly, you don't become dependent on it. You can't, you're able to stop it at any time. But also you could be the person that can't and then you develop an eating disorder and whether it's anorexia or whether it's binge eating, so it doesn't matter. You are encouraging eating disorder behavior. And I, I think the fact that, that there, there is no science, there is no evidence to suggest weight loss is a good idea or that it's even sustainable for the vast majority of people. The fact that there is a lot of evidence that health at every size, health at every size, intuitive eating, anti-diets, nutrition is actually at least as good as, if not much, much better for you. No, not as good as, it's just better for you. Um, that it works and it improves health markers, it improves health outcomes. So we've got the evidence for, we've got the evidence against weight loss, we've got the evidence for anti-diet and health at every size. And yet these guidelines are saying, don't, do not adopt a health at every size approach and do continue with this weight centric, weight normative approach. Then I noticed that they mentioned don't do health at every size at the bottom. And I noticed that they gave it a 2D rating in terms of the evidence. In other words, as about as weak as evidence as possible for that recommendation. Each recommendation comes with sort of strength of evidence. And that is like a D minus, right? A 2D is a D minus. And they still put it in the damn guidance and it really really was awareness week at the same time and that just 
I don't know, it just really bugs me. It bugs me. I feel like we as a health profession are essentially prescribing eating disorders or disordered eating, which can in turn lead to an dis eating disorder. And then when people develop eating disorders, we kind of go, oh, you're not thin enough, so we're not going to treat you. And that is basically what we do. And that disgusts me. And I feel like we need to do a better job of that. I couldn't agree more. And I actually, right before we hopped on today, I was reading the national eating disorders.org. Um, Cause it is eating disorder awareness week. And this statistic, I put this on TikTok, and I think three people have seen it in the two hours that it's been up because that's just where we are right now. Right. With things that matter. Um, but this statistic states that 40 to 60% of elementary school girls ages six to 12 are concerned about their weight or about becoming too quote quote unquote fat. And this concern has been shown to endure throughout their life. Like that alone should show the Academy of Nutrition yeah. and Dietetics that we're doing something wrong. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, the guidelines <clears throat> are supposedly for adults only and not for children and adolescents, but that's not the point. I mean, if that's what's going to happen to you when you're 18 years old, teaching children, like th this is, this is the, this is the gold standard as an adult. So kids are going to be like, yeah, but until then I can be okay. No, children learn from adults. They role model themselves after adults. So it's terrible. And like you say, like, it's frightening what's happening. And with, when it comes to eating disorders, like I did genuinely do not understand why we are not more concerned than we are and I don't know what it's like in other countries but certainly in the UK we are woefully unprepared for the spike in eating disorders that already exists but is going to continue to rise and rise and rise and rise over the next 10 20 years like there's just the service is poor um the understanding is poor doctors don't even know how to recognize let alone diagnose let alone treat an eating disorder i would say that the vast majority of doctors don't even know what binge eating disorder is i don't think they know like they might have heard of anorexia and bulimia <clears throat> they may be able to tell you what those things mean they won't have heard of atypical anorexia and they won't have heard of of, of binge eating so that's how bad the state of medicine is in the uk it might be different in other countries but it worries me because like if we can't even like we can't even pick it up <laughs> and we're just producing more and more and more of these kids that you're talking about they'll become adults and then what will happen to them but you know they're, they're, they're going to be very unwell and there are studies and there's one that was published in the american academy for the american academy of pediatrics it was back in 2016 it's neville Alden is the primary author it's a bit of a i don't like the article i don't agree with the conclusion i never do with these studies but it made it very clear that dieting, weight talk, body talk, weight shaming, all of these things are risk factors, not only for eating disorders that in which young people lose a lot of weight, but also in eating disorders in which young adolescents tend to gain a lot of weight. And so we are not picking up the fact that young people who suddenly have quite a dramatic change in body weight may well have an eating disorder because we assume that they have to get really thin. Actually, sometimes it's the exact opposite to what's happening. Um, so even that, you know, they're saying this is really damaging. <laughs> Why are we doing it? It's absurd. I could go on and on about it forever, but then, you know, we'd run out of time. So I will <sighs> breathe. Well, I think it's really ironic that it is National Eating Disorder Awareness Week and A&D decides to drop these, you know, uh, quote unquote guideline reviews. And just for those who are listening, because I don't know if we necessarily even said what those guidelines that they want us to review are, just the title alone, trigger warning, very stigmatizing using both O words here, but medical nutrition therapy interventions for adult overweight and obesity treatment. So basically saying like being overweight or being obese is a disease, which we talked all about in our last episode with you. So we will be linking that in the show notes, yeah. but I think what a perfect kind of transition over to your no way campaign. And I would just love to hear from you. If you could just tell us what is no way, how was it born? Where did it come from? And just anything and everything you want to share about it.
Um, I think I'm going to start with where it came from. So <clears throat> I got involved in, like, I think yours was one of the first podcasts I've ever done. That's why I have like, I have like very fond memories of it, actually. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. But I started getting involved in this stuff. Yeah, I was pretty clueless. I've learned a lot in the last, since the last time we spoke, you know, I've done a lot more research and diving into the research and doing like deep dives into specific conditions. But I knew straight away, the moment I got involved in this community, and it started off as the anti-diet community, and it's now, you know, beyond that, you know, it's about body liberation. It's not just about not dieting, but actually learning to love and accept your body. Um, but as I got into this, I realized straight away that, that, that my colleagues and I are very much uh, guilty and have, a, a, you know, need to be held accountable, but also have a lot to undo because we've caused the same only ones. Like I'm not suggesting that doctors are the most important people in the world, you know, much as we like to think that we are. But, but you know, the, the field of medicine and doctors specifically have caused a lot of damage. And I noticed that nutritionists, dietitians, dietitians were leading the way. Like I could see that they were miles ahead of any other health profession. And I got the quick question over and over again, and what do I do? Like, I know all of the stuff or I've read the stuff or I've heard the stuff or I listen to the podcast. But what I do when I go in front of the doctor, I can't I can't speak, let alone anything else. And it's so interesting because there's this incredible sort of position of authority over yourself because you're being attacked and you are being attacked. So people kept asking me, how do you do this? And I was just like, well, you know, if I had like a formula that I could sort of just prescribe to you really easily then I would but unfortunately I don't so I'm gonna have to do a bit more than that and I kept thinking what would be really cool is if I was just sat with every one of these people in the doc's office when their doctor was giving crap and I like spoke on their behalf but seeing as I can't do that the next best thing is to provide a resource that they could have which basically says all the things that I've been saying but is sort of I would like to think relatively easily accessible um that you can use in the moment and it is like I I designed this website myself I'm not a website developer so it, it's in its infancy and it needs to be improved and it needs to be more streamlined but as it's at the moment if you go to ww and then way w-e-i-g-h the the clue is in the title um you will find a whole bunch of resources for both people um and you don't have it doesn't just have to be fat people it's any person like because you know this applies to the whole world um and and for professionals so the two separate things and um in the section that is for people for patients i've called it um there are a whole kind of host of things that you can hopefully easily access even when you're in the doctor and that if they're saying something you, you don't like you can just read it out or like even just hand your phone over to them um i've made some downloadable resources that you can print out and send to your doctor in advance or that you can take with you. There's a card. Um, Julie does these lovely cards, you know, the don't wear me unless it's medically necessary. Like, so uh, uh, that, that card is like way pretty. Yeah. Um, my card has a QR code. That's the only difference is it has a QR to the website if you're feeling a bit techy like that. Um, and on, it's not just about weighing. Weighing is the first point. So we've got to stop. We've got to stop. weighing people because the only reason we weigh this completely useless flawed unit of measurement it has a 50 percent false positive and a 30 percent false negative rate that is unacceptable by any medical standards so we should not be using bmi and it needs to be scrapped just we have to do away with it so by not weighing yourself or not be allowing yourself to be weighed what you're saying is i will not allow you to calculate my bmi you're going to have to find another way to assess my health and my health status and that's why I'm encouraging everybody to say no way. It doesn't matter what size you are, because we have to show that we as an entire nation are united, not just nation, world, are united against BMI. BMI is a racist, completely flawed, completely outdated concept that was introduced by Sue in 1970, whatever it was, two, three, four, five, whatever, in the 1970s. Let me explain, let me tell you, this dude went on to write a book called 
we all know where his head was at. He was very, I mean, this is, this is, the guy who was very much involved in the Minnesota starvation experiment and then went from that into some really kind of stigmatizing um, research that perhaps founded a lot of the problems that we have today. BMI is, is a terrible tool and it needs to be scrapped. So done. That's the first thing. But beyond that, we need to um, we need to get rid of weight centric care. So weights, uh, sorry, weight centric health care. So health care that focuses on weight loss because it's useless it doesn't play any role you know you want to treat diabetes you don't have to mention weight you want to treat arthritis you don't have to mention weight you know you want to treat i don't know a blocked nose you don't have to mention weight it's irrelevant it's completely irrelevant so we need to move away from weight-centric care that's the second thing and i explain why that is and why it has no place in modern medicine and um, then the third thing I say is that we need to get rid of weight stigma. Now, weight stigma is that kind of, um, you know, the, the really negative stereotypes that people have about fat people. Um, specifically, it is the anti-fat bias in action. So it's, you know, people will have ideas and thoughts about people. And then when they put that into action by, you know, weighing you unnecessarily, bringing up weight loss, making judgments about you. And, and it's, you know, sometimes it's really abusive stuff like poking you. Um, you know, someone um, told me once that their doctor just pointed to their mouth and just said, you need to put a little bit less in here and pointed to their mouth. Um, like looking in your handbag to see if you've got snacks. I and mean, I've heard some really hideous stuff. I heard of one woman who was having a gynecological exam, having like a pap smear and her doctor weight shamed her and told her that she was fat whilst she was doing the procedure. I mean, these, this kind of stuff is just horrendous. So this is like extreme stigma, but any kind of weight stigma is wrong. And I talk about that and why it's dangerous, why it's harmful, how it harms, how it impacts doctors and healthcare professionals, how it impacts the healthcare professional um, and patient relationship, and how it damages people because internalized weight stigma is associated with poorer health outcomes. And then the last thing I talk about is weight referral, weight management referrals. So we're seeing a lot more of this in the UK where people are being encouraged to go to a program like um, Weight Watchers or, or something similar, Noom, I mean, you know, you name it. There are hundreds of programs out there like that. But the NHS is paying for you to, to go to these things now. And in more, of the, more than that, the NHS is financially incentivizing doctors to refer you for weight loss, um, weight management. That, of course, there's beyond that is the weight loss drugs. And then even beyond that is weight loss surgery. And I have a lot to say about both of those things as well. So that's in a nutshell what it's about the purpose of it and then I focus on that for patients but I also focus on it for professionals the purpose of it is because I want people to have something that they can say to their doctors I really don't want patients to have to advocate for themselves at all it's despicable that patients ever have to advocate for themselves in the front of a doctor because quite frankly your doctor is supposed to be advocating for you there is a concept of consent in the medical uh in the medical world the healthcare world i had to learn about consent before i was ever allowed to touch a patient or go near a patient because consent is one of the foundations of of medicine and when a patient says no no means no like medical consent is like sexual consent no it has to be an enthusiastic yes or it's a nothing you cannot coerce you cannot pressure you cannot blackmail or bribe people to do something that you want them to do so if you say hashtag no way don't say the hashtag that's just embarrassing my children keep saying that but if you say no way you're not weighing me that's it you have refused consent and nobody should ever ever try and coerce you because that technically is assault you know in the same way that if someone pressures you to try and have sex that's sexual assault well if someone tries to pressure you to do something that you've refused your consent for that's medical assault so it's unacceptable and so I wanted people to have like a way to just kind of shut it down shut it down but also I wanted a way to educate my colleagues because they are not interested in listening to me they don't care what I have to say they think I'm an idiot and you know they dismiss me and that's fine I am asking them to put in the work uh for no money and they don't want to do that because why would anyone want to work harder for no money um so what we need to do is we need to get the medical profession to the point where they 
are forced to act because they won't act otherwise. So my hope is that this campaign grows and becomes a thing, becomes a bit of a phenomenon. I'm not getting anything out of it. I don't even get like a penny from it. It's not going to benefit me, but I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that it will upset my colleagues, that I will become so infamous that they will be forced to listen to me. They won't want to, they will despise me for it, but it's fine, because I want to force the medical profession to, to hold themselves accountable, to apologize for all the crap they've done up until now, and to change immediately with immediate effect. So we collectively have to make our doctors feel uncomfortable. And that's what I really want to do. I want to empower you to take back, well, to take back that power. And, you know, to, to realize that actually you're the boss in this situation. I need to call out two things. One, the website you said you made it yourself. It's very impressive. <laughs> so please give yourself some credit here because you should see the magic that I come up with. Um, but two, what I think, what I love the most about this site, and I'm in the patient portal right now is what I'm looking at or the patient part. You know, we as dietitians, I've said this many times people, you know, you don't need to get weighed at X, Y, and Z, but people will come back and say, well, my doctor said it's for a medical quote unquote reason. And on this site, it walks you through the questions to ask back to your practitioner. If they say, yes, we need to weigh you. There's legitimately like word for word, what you can say to your doctor to ask them a follow-up question if they actually need your weight. And if they do, if there is a reason, there is Again, something that you, there's information for you of what you can do in that scenario. I mean, this is an incredible amount of information and an incredible resource for everyone. And as a follow-up, there is, you know, a piece on here where if the doctor is asking for you to be weighed and it's all of these other things, like you really don't need to, and here's the science behind why. And I want to call out too that pregnancy is one of them. Um, I know a lot of women, and I'm sure Sam could speak to this because she's in it right now, that are incredibly triggered during their monthly visits at the doctor when they're pregnant for these weights that it really doesn't matter. <laughs> like There's no reason for it. I mean, literally the only reason that I can imagine that we would be concerned about your weight in pregnancy is if you're losing weight in pregnancy. Right, you have hyperemesis. Yes. If you have hyperemesis, you're not peeing and you're losing weight, we should be concerned. That's a legitimate reason to weigh you. But we should be saying to you, hey, you haven't eaten for like, you know, three months now. We're worried. We need to assess you. So we need to weigh you. And, and as you said, I've made it very clear that there are instances when you need to be weighed. They are much fewer. Like everyone always goes on about the anesthetic dose. How many times are you having an operation in your life? If you're going to the doctor every month and having an operation, my friend, you need more than like weight stigma training. This is a problem, you know, like how often do you need an anesthetic? There is only one type of contraceptive that you actually need to be weighed for. And that is the combined contraceptive pill. And there is a type of drug that is quite commonly used, which is an anticoagulant, it's a blood thinning drug. Um, it ends in the word, a ban, a pixaban, river rocks a ban, like it's one particular group of drugs. And we need to calculate your creatinine, uh, creatinine clearance. That's basically looking at how well your kidneys are functioning. And in that situation, we do know to need, need to know your weight so that we can do the calculation. But you don't need to know anything about that calculation. There are many times when I am doing calculations about your treatment, like what drug to give you, and I'm doing calculations. I don't tell you, I don't sit here and go, well, your potassium is 4.6 and your creatinine is 123. So I've decided, I don't tell you that. I just give you the prescription. And it's the same with weight. So if there is a medication that you do need to be weighed for, and believe me, they are few and far between. It's usually a specialist that's using them. There are like a few antibiotics that specialists use and like HIV drugs. Like there's, there's a few, of course, but the vast majority of you are not taking these medications. Um, when you're pregnant, why do you need to be weighed? Literally, what difference is that going to make? Because you're not weighing the fetus. Like if you want to weigh the fetus, or you can't, but you can do scans, but you're not weighing. I mean, it's completely unnecessary. And they do it and they say they need your weight at booking to decide whether or not you need this treatment and that treatment. This is very fat phobic stuff anyway, and I don't believe in the science behind it. But even if your doctor insists on the first visit or your midwife, whoever insists on the first visit that you need to have a booking weight. Fine. You make it very clear. 
You may weigh me, but I don't want to see the weight and I do not want to discuss the weight and you will not mention it to me at all. And you will not record it in my handheld notes where I have to look at it. You can record it on the computer where I don't have to see it. And you will not bring up my weight ever again and you will never weigh me again. You can have one weight from me and that is the end of that. That's how all pregnancies should be. You do not need to be weighed in pregnancy at any point in time. It's completely useless. And actually you don't need to be weighed for anything. Like what, I mean, why do I need to weigh you if you're diabetic? I'm doing a diabetic review. I need to know your blood pressure. I need to know your cholesterol. I need to know if your feet are okay. I need to check your eyes, but I don't need to know your weight because it isn't going to influence my treatment unless I'm going to tell you to lose weight. And we have to remember that this medicalization this, of weight, this medicalization of fatness is purely exists for the, for the benefit, for the profit of the weight loss industrial complex in particular drug companies the only people benefiting from this is drug companies and they are benefiting to the tune of billions so you know you just need to look, dig a little deeper someone told me that that um um this this guy that's what we were talking about is sponsored by novo nordisk now i don't know if that's true so i'm not going to make that accusation but if it is true that tells me everything i need to know I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised either because these these guys have their fingers in all the pies right now and we know why. They are selling a weight loss drug that is going to make them billions. I keep telling people, go watch Dope Sick um, and see what Purdue did to chronic pain. That is exactly what drug companies have been doing when it comes to fatness and the, the medicalization of fatness. That is exactly what has happened over the last 20 years. Our weight as a nation has actually stabilised. Um, everyone quick to go on about how diabetes cases are rising. In the vast majority of countries, they're going down. As much as they're rising, they're going down. We, we don't, we've got to stop worrying about these things. But if you're a drug company that sells diabetes drug, you, you need to, you know, you need to worry about your profits, your bottom line. So if you're selling less because less people are getting diabetes, you've got to find another way to make that to make that cash. So, oh, we won't talk about them too much. They put my blood pressure up. I can't. I can't. The name Novo Nordisk makes me want to literally tear out my hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, just speaking on pregnancy, like you guys said, there is literally no need for it. But I can't even the the little bits that I've shared on social media, just about pregnancy and intuitive eating in my journey, the amount of comments that come through of, you know, coming from somebody in a larger body saying like, my doctor told me not to gain too much weight, right. During pregnancy. And just the, the weight stigma, the, the shame that comes with that, the, as if we don't have enough to worry about when we're growing a human body inside of our own and want to like survive birth, right. Um, to have that on top of it is just absolutely terrible. And then I also just just we'll link this in the show notes as another resource. Um, I want to just talk about real quick fat positive fertility. I don't know if you've ever connected with Nicola, but just <laughs> thinking about whenever we were talking about anesthesia, I'm like, well, I had four surgeries with anesthesia going through infertility. And that's another one where, you know, people who reside in larger bodies that just are getting shut down for fertility treatments because of the size of their body and, and, and anesthesia and bring a part of conversation. So between yourself and Nicola at fat positive fertility on Instagram, just wanted to give that and kind of marry those two worlds there. Cause that is just a whole nother layer of like weight stigma on top of yeah. a medical condition that just, again, blood pressure rising over here. Like I get yeah. angry thinking about it. So um, I will text her and tell you, tell her that you said that. I, Nick, Nick and I are really good friends. Like, as in we, like, we, we chat on WhatsApp about you know, important things yes. like cake. And, you know, like we, we, we've not actually managed to see each other in person all because of COVID. Yeah. Um, but we are really, really close. And Nicola is absolutely without doubt the expert. And I think she often feels that because she doesn't have that medical degree, um, mm -hmm. that her voice is somehow not as important or as valuable, which just says a lot about society, because if I ever want to know anything about pregnancy or fertility, I, I literally go, yeah, I'll get back to you. And I go and ask my friend, Nicole. I, I don't, you just, you just text her and ask her, she knows everything. And interesting that you mentioned fertility, because I think pregnancy, once you're pregnant, um, they, we have an obligation to care for you, but we really don't like fat being people being pregnant. And when I say we, I am very happy with fat being people being pregnant, but I'm talking about of the course. medical profession. The medical profession doesn't like fat people being pregnant because fat people supposedly make fat babies and we definitely don't want any more of those. So 
so um <clears throat> a lot of people talk about eugenics i i think that there is a case to be made there that like literally they're shutting it down but again with fertility there's there's no evidence that people can't get pregnant in a bigger body i mean that's just nonsense there's no evidence there's no evidence also that um that you're more at risk I mean, they talk about these risks in pregnancy really like you know we can manipulate data to show a lot of things but there are plenty of people as i said who fall pregnant naturally in larger bodies so is there any reason why we can't help those people to fall pregnant in larger bodies no and you know even like the argument that like well the nhs shouldn't pay for it even if you want to get it done privately in the uk you still can't get it done like it's really really difficult it's really upsetting and it's not based in science and i would like to point out this whole anesthesia risk i'm sorry i call am i allowed to swear nod to me if i'm allowed to swear okay what fine. do you so, think <laughs> okay fine um i call bullshit come on now if you're telling me that I cannot have an anesthesia uh, for my gallbladder operation or for my egg, you know, egg, my embryo transfer or my egg removal, or if I can't have uh, anesthesia, you know, to replace my knee, but I can have anesthesia for weight loss surgery, which is a heavy going operation and has a mortality rate of up to 1%, depending on which uh, procedure you go for. Like, I'm sorry, you're saying that you can't fix my knee which is hurting me and preventing me from moving and moving has health benefits beyond weight. Moving has benefits on my mental health or all sorts of things, my cardiovascular health. You're telling me that I have to be in chronic pain and unable to eat properly with this gallbladder, or I have to bleed and be in chronic pain with endometriosis, but you will not do anything about it. You will not help me to fall pregnant, but you will put me through weight loss surgery well what anesthetic risk if you're prepared to do that then you should be prepared to do everything and that's i mean it's such hypocrisy and it's such nonsense it's heartbreaking i've in the uk um uh, somebody who i know a friend of mine who is who is transitioning um was saying like they can't they can't get top surgery anyone over the age of anyone with a bmi over 40 you cannot get gender affirming surgery whether it's nhs or private in the uk it's impossible and they said to me did you know this and i was like yeah that's why i've never even looked into it like it's just it's done i know you can't uh, this is devastating stuff you know people who want to have babies people who need surgery for you know something that is integral to their health and well-being their quality of life is massively impacted by it you can't have it but weight loss surgery go ahead we'll encourage it even you know so yes that is completely wrong and anyone who is having anyone who wants to get pregnant or is struggling with pregnancy or fertility or whatever at fat positive fertility and nicola and i will be doing lots of things in conjunction with each other and she's definitely going to be part of no way i mean like she already is in the background um but she will become in a more kind of vocal way um yeah Amazing. We did a podcast with her. So we'll make sure to link hers in your show notes so people can hear that and, and learn more about her, but to switch gears with no way and resources for professionals, right? Because there are so many professionals who hear about health at every size, who hear about intuitive eating. And they're like, that sounds nice. And they'll get curious about it. But then again, because of how prominent weight centric healthcare is there, they have too much fear to really do the work or to, to look into it. So what, what can people expect from the professionals resources page? Hey guys, Sammy here. And Jenna and I have absolutely been loving the Arrowhead Mills products. So I'm really excited to share them with you. And specifically one of my favorite ways to use one of their products in the kitchen, the Arrowhead Mills Organic Steel Cut Oats. Now we all know that fiber is important and I have especially learned how important it is in pregnancy with trying to stay regular. <clears throat> And I have been loving the Arrowhead Mills Organic Steel Cut Oats, which just happens to be an excellent source of fiber, which has just happened to, you know, help me stay regular, TMI. But um, this has been one of my favorite staple breakfasts in pregnancy. And I want to share with you just how I mix it up. So I'll use the Arrowhead Mills Organic Steel Cut Oats, and then I mix that with blueberries, chia seeds, my favorite crunch in there has been some slivered almonds, but if you have a nut allergy, you could always throw some seeds in there, 
Usually I'll drizzle a little bit of a, you know, a peanut butter or a sunflower seed butter on top and also a little honey. Now you do not have to be pregnant to enjoy this yummy nourishing breakfast idea. It is good for every single human who just loves to have a nourishing, fulfilling breakfast. So make sure to use code ARROWHEAD, all caps, all one word, at vitacost.com to receive 15% off all of the products that you want to try. Again, that is code ARROWHEAD at vitacost.com to get 15% off all products and make sure to shoot us a DM. If you try this recipe, if you try any of their products, we would love to hear your feedback and which products you love the most. So you remember earlier, I was talking about the four things. We get rid of weighing and BMI. We get rid of weight stigma. We get rid of weight-centric care. We get weight, rid of weight um, management referrals. So I've got those four sections. And in each section, there are, I don't know, like between five and 10 sort of bullet points, like drop down, like bullet points. Um, so one might say, you know, BMI is in an accurate, you know, it does not predict metabolic health, for example. You drop down, you get a little bit from me where I've kind of um, summarized what the research says, and then like just hyperlinks, you just click and find the, re- the, the paper that I've, I've drawn that from. Um, I have also listed right at the bottom, if you scroll to the very bottom, I've listed I don't know how many it is. I think it might be seven, I would say, crucial papers to read. Um, They are like the foundations and uh, they're all free. They're all available. And I I feel like anyone who is dipping their toe, um, you know, I've summarized it on the website based on those papers. Uh, So you can read my summaries, but then I also recommend reading these papers. And some of them have, you know, if you then want to start doing the deep dives, you know, they have like 100, 150 references that you can refer to for the specific studies. Um, Evelyn Tripoli, uh, Evelyn Tripoli.com has uh, the list of, I don't know, it's a 15 page document now, that's how big it is, uh, of all the um, intuitive eating uh, papers that have been published. And that's really useful if you're interested in intuitive eating. Um, so there are, you know, there's lots of link to resources. I, I mentioned some books that I think are fundamental. One of the things I have been thinking about recently is that when you're in medical school, you don't learn anything to do with social justice, which I, I think is a crying shame. If we want to really fix the world, like, you know, we talk about medical education, there needs to be a section on um, social justice. We need to be talking critical race theory we need to be talking um you know fat phobia and and weight stigma all of these things like we actually need to be teaching medical students day one maybe not just medical students like all health professionals because if you don't understand social justice and you're not coming from that sort of social justice perspective then you're going to miss a lot of things so there has to be some there is some element there also on the website of the social justice of it all so there's one specific section which i haven't worked i haven't done yet and i'm working on which is going to be all about intersectionality and social justice and then there's another section which is to me i think the most important section which is about lived experience if you're a health professional and you're thinking should I be paying more attention go read the lived experiences tell me you know read them like you've got to be stone cold like a stone cold killer to not read those and just go wow okay we're getting it wrong and even if you're not the one doing that even if you read it and you're like well I would never do that but your colleagues are and so I, I don't know but again around the, the rest of the world but in the general in the in the UK we, we follow the general medical council um good medical practice that's the like that's the equivalent of our Hippocratic oath right and it specifically says that we have to hold our colleagues accountable when they are essentially messing up so even if you're not that doctor even if you're the nice doctor that never would do that to a patient um read the lived experience and then realize that you need to get involved the only thing that I am not doing well and I need to do better at is I need to have some lived experiences about when it went right. And that is something that I'm going to work on straight away because I feel like I'm a lot of negative, like a negative, oh, I can't think of a gender neutral Nancy, <laughs> negative something. Noah, negative Noah. I'm a negative Noah. Um, I keep being really negative, but I need to have some really, because po- people have got some really positive experiences with doctors as well. People often write to me and just say, hey, actually, my doctor is incredible. So we need to put those down as well so that doctors can look at it and go, oh, actually, there's a really good way to do this. So 
that's other resources as well for professionals. So yeah, you can go on there and you can see the science. There's loads of science on there, loads of papers. I did a deep dive into diabetes um, recently and read studies. And I'm, I'm friends with Greg Dodell, who's everything endocrine on Instagram. Uh, he's an endocrinologist who works in New York. And I messaged him and I was like, have you read these? <laughs> because I did not know half of this stuff. And we've had this kind of back and forth and we're sharing papers with each other. Some of the most, re the most recent evidence is showing that actually diabetes for a person in uh, at, at the incidence of diabetes. So when you first get diagnosed, you do better if you're fat than if you're thin. Like that's what the studies show. And there's lots of reasons why that might be, but actually we are all taught to fear diabetes in a big body because it's our fault. Actually, what the evidence is showing is that if you're fatter, you'll probably do better. So it's okay to be fat. And that takes a whole low, it takes a weight off my shoulders. Someone who's always sort of feared diabetes in the past, it takes a weight off my shoulders. It's like, actually, I can go into this and I'm gonna, if and when, and most likely when I get my diagnosis, I can be like, that's all right. Because the studies show that I'm actually going to do better. And it gives me the confidence to then walk in front of my diabetic nurse or my diabetic doctor and say, enough with this weight loss stuff. There's also studies to show that if you gain weight during your diabetes, it has zero um, impact on your health outcomes. Zero impact on death, your death rate, your mortality rate. Zero. So you can be diabetic and gain weight. And still be okay and so a lot of people are like oh intuitive eating when you're diabetic probably not a good idea no it is a good idea not only have we found that you know uh, sort of health at every size or intu you know health at every size um or intuitive eating type um nutrition I, I don't know what the correct word for that is but um not only have we found that that actually helps with your blood sugar and there are studies to show that but we've also found that in the long term, even if you do intuitive eating and you gain weight, nothing will happen to you. Nothing. And that's like, I don't know, that was that was very reassuring. And that was just one condition. So uh, as I deep dive and as I go into these things, you'll see I'll keep updating the website. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time to read all the literature, so I can't do it for every condition straight away. But I'm hopefully going to catch the biggies to start with and then work from there. Every single quote on like that's been called out on this website, like stops you in your tracks. Like at least it does for me. And I'm sure many can relate to this too. And it's an incredible amount of work that you've put. Have you done this like since our last podcast recording? Oh my gosh. Shall I, shall I tell you when I started it? I started, no. it. I started it January 8th. Wow. Where are we now? Yeah, it's February not even March. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I was thinking about as you were talking, obviously listening to what you're saying, but reflecting like from our first episode, I forget what the, the time frame was, but like when we were talking to you that first episode, we were like, oh my gosh, we're so excited to have, you know, a fat positive doctor, like someone who gets health at every size. And you were like, yeah, like a few months ago, I was doing my weight loss journey blog. And I was like, Holy shit. Like yeah. I had no idea how yeah. much of a radical change you've had. And obviously there's been a big change in your life personally and professionally since we've last talked to you, you know, from Natasha to Asher. So I would love to hear how like this journey of just unraveling weight stigma and the anti-diet work, like how has it changed you personally? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> you know, I, I say it at start of January 8th. It didn't. This is like 10, 20 years probably in the making. But what had to happen is I had to go through it. I had to experience it myself. This is why I'm so passionate is because I have experienced weight stigma throughout the journey, like during my pregnancies. And whenever I go and see the doctor, I experience weight stigma. And I've had some really stigmatized. One day I'll share them. I'll, I'll share some of the most stigmatizing moments that I've experienced at the, at the hands of doctors and nurses. So I had to go through that first. And I think there was this, you know, this, this was the, there was this very illogical um, and very sort of difficult to explain, really sort of, sort of, how do I explain it? Like inside of me, there was one half of me that was just like, I just want to love me for who I am. And then there was another part of me that was like, I can't. And there was one part of me that was just like, this isn't the right way to treat patients. But then there was the other half of me that was like, being fat is so bad that, you know, I am following the weight normative approach. But it was like there was a fight going on inside of me. There was this fight because I knew it was wrong deep down inside in my gut. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have the words. I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't have the, the evidence to 
I guess, allow that part of me to sort of take over. I was doing a weight loss blog, as I said in my last podcast, I was doing a weight loss blog. And then, um, I, I, you know, I fell into a very deep depression. It was one of the worst depressions I've ever been through. I have a history of chronic depression, but this was a really bad time in my life. And I realized it was completely related to the diet. Like it was, I was crushing because I was crashing. You know, I had, I had no energy and I became really ill. I'd lost a ton of weight, but I was so ill. And I think in that moment, in that turning point where I kind of said, like, I'm not doing diets ever again. That's it. Then I found anti-diet, you know, the anti-diet world. And I found it on Instagram. I started following people like yourselves. You know, I started like reading like all these dietitians like talking about stuff. I was like, what? And then I started reading and then I started reading some more. And then I started reading some more. So this has been kind of 20 years in the making, but a very quick change. And I think the reason it's been so radical is because uh, one, I've had it in my heart for a really long time. Once I found the words and I found the literature, the scientific literature to back up what has always been, I'd always felt deep down inside. It was like, it was like an explosion. Something just went off. And I was just, I cannot keep going the way that I've been going. And it happens that like I turned 40 at the same time. Like it was a COVID was happening. There was a lot of things that intersected at the same time. Um, I got to a place of radical body acceptance and I, I never thought I would. I had been going to therapy for years, years to help me overcome my body issues. I spent a fortune on therapy. I'm actually going, I'm actually seeing the therapist again, but nothing to do with body weight. And I, I joke actually with her. I was like, do you remember when I used to really struggle with my body image? Do you remember that? And, and, you know, she's always laughing. She's like, yeah. And, and she, she often says, well, if you manage to, you know, you know, manage to overcome that, you can overcome anything. But, it took me years of really hating, like couldn't look in the mirror, hated everything about myself, then found anti-diet culture, found these <clears throat> incredibly, again, like yourselves following you, following people who are putting these really wonderful messages out there and like, you know, all glamorous, but like spooning peanut butter out of the, out of the, <laughs> out of the tub. And I'm like, ooh, can we do that now? Are we allowed to do that? Um, <clears throat> so and then I did an intuitive eating course and that really helped, massively helped. And then I got to a stage where I really learned to love my body. And like, there was no part of me anymore that, that wanted to change my body, except there was a huge part of me that wanted to change my body. And I was really struggling because it wasn't a fat thing anymore. Like I was really comfortable with the fat, but something still didn't sit right. And I started to explore that. And what I realized is that I, my whole life, I've been acting, I have been performing and it's really flipping exhausting because when I was really little, I didn't want to be a girl. I, I remember being very clear at the time that I wasn't a girl, don't treat me like a girl. And, you know, now if I've been born in, you know, in the 21st century, in the 2020s, people would know what that meant. But I was born in the 1980s and I was just told off. And actually it was weird because my mum was really keen on me being a feminist, which of course I am. And, you know, she was like, you can do anything that you want to do. It doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy, but she didn't kind of affirm anything to do with gender. Like, you know, she almost said like gender doesn't exist. It's like saying race doesn't exist. Color doesn't exist. She taught me that too. She also taught me that there's, you know, there's no such thing as race, which in a way was a very kind of forward thinking thing at the time. I was surrounded by a whole bunch of racists. My mom was like super cool when it came to race, but she didn't see race. And that now I realize how problematic that was because race is a social construct as is gender and no one explained that to me and I learned that like in my 40s so as I'm struggling with my body but not because I'm fat but because of something else I suddenly realize there's something more going on there's something more going on and this is where I swear to you intuitive eating changed my life it really has because I am so in tune with my body now in a way that I have never been before I never freak out when my body does something weird and it often does so when I'm like craving, the other day was craving citrus fruit. And I went on like the citrus fruit binge. I have never eaten so many oranges in my life. And I kept thinking I could, couldn't stop craving them. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like you've had too much now, like cut yourself up. Couldn't stop eating citrus for two days. And then I got this cold. And we all know that vitamin C helps, um, you know, you recover from a cold. I swear my body was just telling me you need vitamin C. It was craving vitamin C. So I've realized that as I become more in tune with my body, I'm better at understanding my menstrual cycle. I'm better at understanding my mood. So how I eat often and what I crave often tells me where my mood at, where, where my emotions are at. So it helped me to really get in touch with my body. 
in a way that I've never done before. And I realized that actually the stuff that I have been fighting all my life is, is still, I'm still fighting it and I just need to stop. And the moment I stopped, the moment I came out, I, the first person I told was my husband. I was like, I, I'm not a woman. Um, and he, he was a bit like, huh? I was like, no, I'm not a woman. And I explained, and he was like, oh yeah, oh, no, you're not a woman. When I explained it that way, he's like, yeah, I've always known you're not a woman. And then I told my sister and my sister was like, yeah, you've always been my brother. I've always known that. And, you know, we never did any of the things that sisters were supposed to do. We've always had a sister brother relationship. And as as I started coming out, slowly coming out, uh, most of the people in my life were just like, this is obvious. And um, I don't know that must I haven't done nothing, anything drastic physically to my body, but who I am on the inside, like when I look in the mirror now, I'm just like, ah, that's who you are. I changed my name and it's like that last piece of the puzzle um, really just completed everything for me. And I'm I'm so grateful, actually. I, I'm probably going to get all emotional now, but I'm so grateful that I get to experience life. Whether I die tomorrow or not, I have experienced a moment in my life where I am really, truly happy and content and comfortable in my own skin. I've never felt that. And it is such a wonderful feeling. And I trust myself now. But I learned to trust myself with food first. Really, like it was a, such a small thing that changed everything for me. So that is the story of Asha. And of course, the website, like I joke that it, I started on the 8th. Of, I started writing it on the 8th of January. I started like designing it. Um, I paid for the domain name, but I've been writing this for the last year because as I've been researching, I have, you know, got more and more resources and I'm learning more and more. And I'm like still right at the beginning. There's so much more to learn, to understand. But the more conversations I have, the more like I learn when I do my podcast, the more books I'm reading. I'm like, I'm getting there slowly, but surely. So there's a quote that I'm totally going to fuck up, but it's something along the lines of like, when you're your most authentic you or when you're fed or whatever it is, is that's the only way you can change the world. But like, you're your most authentic you and you're changing the fucking world right now. So that's pretty amazing. And I just want to add as like a side note that I watched your live. I think you're, is it your twin sister? No, it's not my twin. Okay. Your sister was on it though, right? on the live where you were explaining Asher I watched that and I watched you just be the most confident human on the internet and I just remember like like writing in as you were talking and it was just it was an incredible thing to watch somebody just really stepping into their power so thank you for sharing that with us today we didn't get a chance to talk about your incredible tiktok but (laughs) can you (laughs) tell people just where they can find you more about the no way campaign and just more information about you and all it is that you do on all your social platforms. So do you need to, do you need to wrap it up or do you want me to talk about TikTok? I don't mind talking about TikTok, but do you, do you need to wrap it up? You have dinner waiting. (laughs) It's fine. So um, a, a little brief history of TikTok. I found TikTok at the age of 41 huge mistake um (laughs) I shouldn't have gone there I'm loving TikTok because I think it's a great way to spread messages and I think that I work best um talking to people face to face than I do writing stuff down like I do like writing but I prefer like videos suits me better so TikTok is a fantastic platform in that way and um I have just been sharing lots of videos of like the stuff I'm putting on the website basically I'm just sharing it in video form the downside of TikTok is, wow, there are some, you know what it is? They're just a lot younger. I think because the platform is used by much younger people, I think I'm getting trolled by really young people. And like Fitspo's, they all hate me, obviously. So it's um, it's hard to navigate the TikTok world. I'm not, I'm not really getting it right. I've just been banned from comment. Like apparently I've been reported one too many times now and I'm not allowed to use the platform for a couple of days. That happens every so often. I've lost my Instagram page four times now. So it's like, eh, it'll come back. Hopefully fingers crossed. If it doesn't, we'll start again. What can you do? Um, but they are, um, yeah. So you can find me on TikTok, uh, it's always the fat doctor UK or fat doctor UK. So on TikTok, it's fat doctor UK. On Twitter, it's the fat doctor UK. I really wish I'd 
been more clever about this when I first did it. Um, Instagram, it's Fat Doctor UK. Um, Facebook, it's Fat Doctor UK. So, and, and also you can go to my website. So you could go to www.fatdoctor.co.uk. And what you'll find there is basically like a little bit about me and all the things I offer, ways to support me. Uh, if you want to support me financially, I'll never say no. But also um, I do something called the waiting room once a month. And these are like live webinars, but you don't have to come live. And they're usually on a topic that people have requested or that I think. So fatty liver is my next one. I've just done diabetes. I've done weight loss surgery. I've done PCOS. I've done joint pain. So what I do is I use a platform called Crowdcast. And people basically like if you get if you register in advance, you have the option to to write questions in advance. So say you live like in the States, or whatever, and you, you time wise, it's not going to work. You can just register, put your put your questions in in advance. And then um, I will do the live. If you can't attend, it's not a problem. The moment I finished, um, it's uploaded onto Crowdcast and you can watch it anytime. And I never remove it. So you can watch it a year from now. Um, I, I do basically kind of half and half. It's about an hour and a half. I do 45 minutes of a presentation uh, with slides and I, I usually like use some I have at least two or three research papers that I do a deep dive into and then um, I do 45 minutes of like Q&A that timing's changed a little bit but it's fun it's been really fun the more people that come the more interesting questions that I get as well so I really love doing those I do that once a month it's always the first Wednesday of every month um so if you go to my website you can find that uh I have my own podcast um it's not as fabulous as yours but you know it's there it's the um, fat doctor podcast um so you can have a listen in. I've had some fantastic guests this year. I'm really enjoying it. And this time, what I've decided to do is I'm doing, um, I've dedicated the whole series to kind of health and wellness culture and debunking a lot of the myths about health and wellness culture. So that's fun. Um, where else can you find me? If you go to www.noway.org, as I said, way is spelled W-E-I-G-H, um, that's where you'll find the campaign. And the, the, the website is, phase one of the campaign I wanted to have that there like a solid piece of information that people could go to but it's a campaign not a website the campaign is yet to come so there are lots of things in the pipeline we're talking uh you know most of them are going to be UK based to begin with but I'm hoping to hook up with lots of people and other parts of the world as well we need to start celebrating um fatness and that is the thing that like I just I insist that we start doing whether or not five people join me or five thousand people join me I don't care we've got to start celebrating I have been going to gay pride since 1998 and when it when 1998 we were super political uh, we now we're just a bit trashy and it's excuse to dress up and um but in 1998 we were fighting for equal rights still it was the end of the fight but we were still fighting and um <sighs> those events are super important and they I think they galvanized the community and they you know it was important and I want to do that as well so I want to see uh, a festival or something to that to the equivalent I want to start I want to start protesting and causing trouble and you know we we are such a fantastic fun community we do all sorts of outrageous things so let's go and get outrageous together I also think that there will be you know, we're trying to get it into the national media. We need to get it into the, the, the national media. So we're going to be as sort of as in, as clever about it as possible. I'm joining forces with loads of people. I'm trying to do this on my own. Um, so if you go to the website and you register and you, you subscribe to the newsletter, I'm not like going to bombard your inbox every five minutes. Like I don't have time to write newsletters. So don't worry about that. But if something's happening, like an event, we'll let you know if we're saying to you, hey, you know, this week we want you all to like go on Instagram and post a picture of you, you know, smashing a weighing scale or something and hashtag no way. Like we will start doing that. And that, and that, that I think will be fun. I'm looking forward to all of that stuff. If you can use the hashtag, like in your web, like in your socials, if you're putting a whole bunch of hashtags, please hashtag no way, because it, it, we want to make that, um, we want to eventually get it trending. We need to get a thing into the light. You know, we had F your beauty standards, you know, after a while, people knew what that was about. So hashtag no way is specifically about being weighed at the doctors. So if you want to get rid of medical weight stigma and you think that's an important thing, then please use the hashtag. It will make such a difference. It will make a massive difference. But yeah. You can find me. I'm probably out there somewhere chatting. <laughs>
to myself. We love it. We love everything that you do. We love all things Asher. And I want to go back. I, I misspoke when I said, how has it changed you personally? Like this work, I really think reflecting on your answer and just all things you, it's really what has made you come home and, and become more of yourself and, and more of you. And that's exactly what we need in this world. And it has been such an honor to have interviewed you earlier in your career and not early in your career, you've been a doctor for many, many years, but in this transition time and see how you've continued to evolve and grow and shake shit up. And we're just <laughs> excited to, to be there right alongside you. Yeah. Um, and I have a feeling this will not be the last time that we interview you um, okay, right <laughs> say, go too fast, too much. So we will definitely make sure to link everything in the show notes notes and send everyone over to noway.org. That is way spelled W E I G H noway.org. Thank you so much, Asher, for being here. And can I just quickly say something, Sammy Jenna, you have always, and Chelsea as well, have always supported me from the beginning. Like you're constantly reposting my stuff. You're coming, you know, you've got big followings yourself. So everything you've done to help me and support me from the beginning until now, I am so, so grateful. And I literally will come once a month if you invite me. I love you both so much. And I really, really appreciate all you've done for me. And I, this is a genuine, genuine from the bottom of my heart. So thank you so much for all your support. You've just, just always been there. I've just always seen you in my DMs or like, you know, tagging me in a story. It's just fantastic. So thank you very much, both of you. We love you. Yeah, yeah we, we love you. Thank you so much. Now you're making me think. I'm like, okay, I, is she going to be like our resident doctor? Like our yes. like, oh. actual work doctor? Like, <laughs> yes. you know, on, like, 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 on, okay, we're manifesting yeah. things. So, oh, I love more that. To come, like, more yeah. to come. That's what, that's what it's at. Yeah, I like that. I'm totally doing that. Let's. Guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of What the Actual Fork Pod. We know there are a lot of pods out there, and we are so grateful that you are here listening with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, share with all your friends and faves, and follow along with us on social at what the actual fork pod we promise to continue to bring you the hottest topics greatest guests and the most fun you can possibly have while fighting diet culture bullshit we love you we appreciate you and we will see you next week for a lot more fun